There we go. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Oh, <laughs> an echo. <laughs> got it. You got it. So we're talking about paratexts, and this was a concept that was developed in the 1990s by a, by a, a philosopher named in, in France called uh, Jeanette. And he was talking about the things that the writers themselves didn't create, but the printers create. Title page, uh, illustrations, perhaps, uh, how they divide up the text, how they alert you that there's a change. Uh, the and the paratext is sort of like a vestibule, a vestibule where you come in and it's welcome, welcoming you into, into the text that you're about to see. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at a Bible that was printed in 1501. And I just want you to, to look at the pages that we're going to see and share your reactions, what you see happening here. So I need to share screen. And the first thing I'm going to do is, here we go. Let's see here. Yeah, this is, yeah. Imprimatur. Ah. So, do you see, do you see uh, 1501, 1502, Grant, mm -hmm. part one? Mm -hmm. All right, we are, we are good to go. So here's a book. Um, we talked about formats. This is a folio format, which means that when the leaf came off the printing press, it was folded only once. Okay, so you fold mm -hmm. it once. And so this is going to give you a very tall book. This is a very, it's 16 inches in height. Okay, so that's fairly formidable. It weighs about 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. so this Good. is not a book that you're going, and for the whole Bible, I need six of these volumes to complete the whole Bible. All right, so here we have this. Mm -hmm. and, and you notice these, you notice these little holes. Uh, you notice these little holes here, these dark spots that are on the cover. Yeah. Yes. They're wormholes. Um, <laughs> people and worms were reading this book. Only the worms ate what they were reading. They digested it. They digested what they were reading. And so we will see these holes uh, throughout the pages as these wood worms just work their way through. This is a cowhide that has been stretched over boards to make this binding. But you can see that they've taken the extra, the extra step and they've actually stamped some designs in this leather binding so that it, it looks impressive. It's to impress the reader. This is a paratext. You know, we here we have here a formidable, a formidable book. It's a very important book. All right. So, and you see here we have this wonderful clasp. Here is a here is the eagle. What we have done in the four corners is we've put the four symbols for the gospels. Matthew will be an angel. Um, Mark will be a lion. Uh, Luke will be the ox, and the eagle will be the gospel according to John. So this is the gospel according to John. And so if you looked at the other four corners, you will also find the other gospels. So this is something a reader would recognize. Did the author request this? No, the printer did this. Did the, you know? And when we come to the Bible, we're not talking about authors, we're talking about editors. The editors are there. The authors are long since, long since dead. So, and you also see some other designs. We have uh, flowers that have been you know, stamped into this, into this cow, this uh, leather, this leather hide, this was well, this cow hide. So in this cow skin that has been worked on. And so here we have this very attractive book. We have more flowers here. So it was intended to impress you. Here's the, the clasp. These are clasps. In order to prevent the book from returning to its original shape, which is what the cow hide will do if you don't secure it, you actually clasp this, and um, if the clasp uh, the clasp comes at the top to the front of the book, that was uh, created on continental Europe. If the clasp goes behind the book and seals it, shuts it, sort of shuts it, then it was done in England. So you can tell where a book has been by where how the clasps work. And here you have this formidable book, formidable book. Um, here you have here you have again the eagle. This is for, for uh, John. This is in the upper corner. And you can see that they stamp this on there. Turn off the TV. All right. Turn off the camera. But now we have, now we have, we have this wonderful, we have this wonderful, huge folio volume, which is the Bible. And now the printers are at work. So 
When you open the Bible, you pretend you are at the Frankfurt Book Fair, which was one of the formidable book fairs in, in the German-speaking territories, and you come to this page. This is 1501. This is what a title page is going to look like. This is what, this is what the title page looks like. Did the editors, did the editors, the, did the editors do this? No, the printer is going to take care of this. The printer is going to do this. So they're trying to attract your attention. So as you look at this, um, you see those two stamps below what was printed. Those are library stamps. We like to stamp everything that we have, you know, your library cards, your library new books, all those things. We stamp things. And this is a title of ownership. So you know where this book where this book came from, where it was housed. Um, most of these Bibles in our rare book collection came out of monasteries, um, monasteries in the German speaking ter territories. And the reason they became available is because of Napoleon. Um, Napoleon is a huge force in Europe in the 19th century and changes the world and uh, annexes territories that uh, west of the east of, west of the Rhine River to France and basically sends the German nobility, the German landowners running. And so they resettle in other parts of Germany and we have now nobility, landowners, independent farmers who can no longer have any land. So then the Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria, and other territories had to think, what do we do with these people? How, we, we, how can we help them? And so they, they did a survey of the, the large landholders in their territories, which were sometimes monasteries. And they said, all right, what we were going to do is you have five Benedictine monasteries. We're going to come down to three. Um, we're going to fuse them. We're going to, to merge them. And so they would merge them and consolidate them into three locations. And the Dominicans had to, had to, had to um, consolidate some of their monasteries, the Benedictines. It goes on and on and on. Well, when they came to the libraries, they said, well, what do we do with their books? Well, we send them to the state library. So Munich, for example, is overwhelmed with these copies of books. They already have two sets of them. Now they have maybe four more added to their collection. Mm. They don't mm. have the space. So that what they do is they, they sell them. They give them to antique book dealers in the early 19th century. They were published in catalogs and people purchased them. In this case, it was Charles Porterfield Cross uh, who purchased these books. So here you have this. So if you look at this title, let's look at the title. Here, here it is printed. It's printed following a manuscript tradition. High a large level of abbreviations, because in manuscripts, you were trying to get a lot of, you were trying to maximize um, your product, you maximize the number of words you could get on a manuscript. It was expensive. So what do you do? We abbreviate. And so these are abbreviations. All of these little, or most of these words have been abbreviated. These little lines above the O, above the E, they, they are saying to you, this is an abbreviation. You need to add to it, and people knew what they needed to do. All right, so here you are, a book buyer, a book buyer, 1501, 1502 in Frankfurt. So let's, here's the full title. Here's what was printed by the printer using this, one, this very interesting font, printed on the title page. All right, the printer made the decision. This is how we're going to do it. This is what it should look like. This is what it translates. So let's read it in English. The first part of the Bible, now for a long time renewed, comprising the Pentateuch, one with the Glossa Ordinaria, the literal and moral explanation of Nicholas of Lyra, as well as additions of Burgensis and replies of Turingi, um, new distinguishing marginal summary annotations. Are you excited Ooh. about this? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Thrilled. You're thrilled. <laughs> I'm absolutely thrilled. I, right. In the 21st century, this wouldn't work. Um, <laughs> but in the 15th, in the 16th century, this was sensational because they had to put on the first page. Imagine this: you're, you, you, what will you do when you're looking at a possible, possibly buying a book? You're going to open the cover. You're going to look at the title page, and they want to get out. They want to tell you everything that you are going to find in this volume to excite you, to get you excited about possibly purchasing it. All right. So they're going to tell you everything that's in here. All right, so here you have it. So we have the first part of the Bible now for a long time renewed comprising the Pentateuch. We know what the Pentateuch is. This first volume are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, mm -hmm. Numbers, and 
Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. You got it. So now, what is this one with the Glossa, Nor Glossa Ordinaria, literal moral explanation of the Glossa Lyra editions of Bergensis? That's Paul, of, Paul of Bergos and Matthias Turing is responding. So let's look at this. So here we are, the first part of the Bible. All right, here it is. Your spell, it spells it all out. So what are you going to do? We're going to turn some pages. All right, so let's look at some, let's look at some additional pages here. So I'm going to remove that one. Let me come back to... Uh, let's look at another screen share here. Let's look at our Bible what, in a different light. Here we are. So let's look, let's go through this. This is where it gets fun. So here we have our brunt. This is what it looks like. The worms have done their work. They've eaten through the cover. They've eaten through the wood panels there and they're on the pages. They're, they've made it through the title page. You can see all the little holes from the wood worms. They've made it through the title page and they will get through the book of Genesis. All right, so now we have this page, which is telling you who are the printers. Who are the printers here? They're explaining this in wonderful Latin text. Does this look appealing to you? <laughs> would, this sell, would this sell today in that format? No. 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 So, okay, so, so this is, so here's, you're responding, this is it. You wanna to respond to this. Does this look appealing? It looks like a lot of work, okay? And what are they telling you? They're explaining what they've done to try and get to convince you they've done a great job and I've enlarged it, okay? You had all this mm -hmm. space. You could have used a bigger, a bigger type, a larger type size, you know, mm -hmm. spread it out. You could have made it a little more attractive. These are paratexts, how you are presenting the text for a reader, for what you want to get across. So, all right, when we get through all of this and it's not really great Latin grammar, um, it's, you know, we come, here are the names of, here are the names of the printers who have worked on them. It's three of them who have worked on this in Basel and it's called the Colophon. This is where they're signing off on it. And you get down to the end and here it is. Oh, actually this is, they're starting in, in Strasbourg. Sorry, um, there it is, um, ex Argentina. Argentina is the um, Latin word for silver. And if your town had a Latin name because it was a Roman settlement, what you would do is often use your Latin name because it, it gave you an air of sophistication. It gave you an air of antiquity. So Strasbourg, which is on the Rhine River between Germany and France, that was in, in the Roman times, it was called Ar Argentina. So it was the silver, it meant silver. Uh, so from, uh, from um, Strasbourg. And it's particularly September, Anno Domini, in the year of, and see, you see this DNI? That's the abbreviation for Domini. And so the reader had to know, would have learned this. This is how we condense this script, how we condense this DN with an I over it, Domini. That's the abbreviation, Anno Domini 1501. All right, so we're printed. Now they're starting in, in Strasbourg, but they eventually have to get to Basel to make, this, to make this happen. Here is your first page. Here is the first page. So what's the first page of the biblical text? What's the book? Genesis. Genesis. All right, Genesis. what chapter? Chapter one. All right, all right, <laughs> there you go. You are on You are on target. All right, you know the first verses. What is, how does the first verse start? In the beginning. In the beginning. That is, In the beginning. That's how we know it. In the beginning. God created, God created the heaven and no, the No, the world was void. That's two, that's verse two. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The world was form and the world was void. void, and the spirit hovered over the spirit hovered over the waters. So okay, so now look at this. Look at this page. This is this is interesting. All right. So you notice that you have these two rather large red eyes that are put there. Mm -hmm. These are hand. These are still being made done by hand. Okay. So a person and all the red marks that you see on this page. All of the red marks that you see were done with a person, a person who was called a rubricator. They had an inkwell with red ink and they would sit there with a pen and that's all they did all day. So there you are. Number one, number two. No, oh, there you go. So we have one huge eye here. We have one huge eye here. You've seen these in illuminated manuscripts. These are, mm -hmm. these are the opening initials. They catch your attention. Yes? Mm-hmm. It got your attention. All right. So 
what's going on on this page? Does, are you lost in this page? If you don't know German or Latin, you're lost. <laughs> you're lost. All right. But if you knew Latin, okay, here, here we go. So let's see what, what, what the printer's trying to do right now. So here's another copy of the same edition, but it went to a different rubricator. And this rubricator had red and blue ink and decided we're going to show off. We're going to get your attention. We are going to put this, we're going to use one in blue and one in red. And so you're trying to sell a book. You're trying to sell a book, all right? So here we are. So where is scripture? Where is the scripture in this, in this, in this, on this page? All right. These are directly taken from manuscripts. We're hugging this, the tradition of writing a manuscript. We're following that because we don't want to distance ourselves from our possible buyers. We're going to follow the format that they're used to. And over time, as we do these the next few few times, we're actually going to see them finally changing the format and introducing a new way of us seeing the scriptures. Incipit Liber Genesis, all right? Here's, this is how you began a man, manuscript. Here begins the book of Genesis. Ta-da! There you go. Here begins, and which is called in Hebrew, Bereshit. And right here, chapter one. All right. So you've been told, here we begin the book of Genesis, which in Hebrew is called Bereshit. They're following the manuscript tradition. So where am I reading the scriptural text? Notice the size of the font, the size of the, the, the type. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here mm -hmm. I see, in principio creavit Deus caelum et terra. In the beginning, beginning yeah. God created oh, it heaven earth. and mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. And the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the abyss. So this is these are one verses one and verses two. That's all the scripture that's on this page. Okay. So then you ask yourself the question, what are they doing? What, what is the rest of this? You know, here, this is, would you, would you feel, commentaries. <laughs> would you feel comfortable? Would you feel comfortable reading the Bible in this format? Uh, it would be very drawn out. Drawn out. Yes. Luther, Luther was raised with this. Luther would have known this type of this type of Bible. He would have used it. He would have been used this in Erfurt. He would have used this in the monastery. This would have been read. This is this is he was very familiar with this format. So hold that in mind, because Luther sees this, but Luther is not going to follow this format. Luther wants to change it. All right. So what is it? What is it? I'm looking at here. What I have here is the biblical text right here. And all of this is commentary. All of this mm. is commentary. And it's by four different commentators. All right. Up here, uh, Glossa Ordinaria, the common tongue, the common interpreter. Right here, through all of this, through all of this here, are the church fathers. The church fathers. So you're going to have a quote from Arjun, a quote from Augustine, a quote from the Venerable Bede. Uh, a quote from Jerome, and they just go put, they get all, they are printed here. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Over here, you see a name, and that's what Glossa Ordinaria means. Over here, you have a name, Nicholas of Lyra. Who is Nicholas of Lyra? Ah, Nicholas of Lyra is a Franciscan, a Franciscan, he is a Franciscan, um, Franciscan uh, monk. He grows up in France. He, he grows up in a village that is near a, a village where there are where there are Jews. So he's he lives in proximity with a Jewish in a proximity with a Jewish community, and he learns Hebrew. So all of a sudden, in the 14th century, this Franciscan monk says, "Oh, let's learn Hebrew so that we can re-examine. Let's learn Hebrew so that we can re-examine the text." Because Latin is a translation. Yes? Yes. Yes. Latin yes. is a translation. It's been around for 1,200 years, but it's still a translation. And Nicholas of Lyra says, oh, let's, let me read it in Hebrew, and let me, let me hear the Hebrew text speak. And instead of using allegory, let me hear what the words are saying. Let me hear what it says. So his commentary is here. 
And then Paul of Bergos, or Bergensis, he is a convert from Judaism. He takes offense at what Lyra is doing. So he has his comments about Lyra's, uh, Lyra's presentation. And then Matthias, Matthias comes along and says, well, I think you're a little too harsh on Nicholas. Let me offer you my insights. <laughs> <When each>, wow. <laughs> all right. Yeah, there you go. Here you go. This is, this is, you've got on one page, four different commentators. And what it says is, and what it says is, what it says is, we often think that, oh, the church had a monolithic presentation. Not quite. There was a, mm. there were a variety of voices out there, and they're all on this page. They're so, all on this page. So who, who was it who chose to put this collection of voices on this page? The printer, the printer made the decision. And there's, there's the key. The printer is making the decision. And this is going to upset some theologians because they thought they were the ones who were going to make the choices. And now the printers take over because they would like to sell you a book. Okay? <laughs> the bottom ah. They wanna sell you a book. And if you're going to yeah. print a book that might be a bestseller, what's your first possibility? The Bible. All right. Uh -huh. So these, and, you've got, you've now got capitalism is coming in. Capitalism, and, you know, I want to publish this book. I need to make a profit. I got to pay off my bills. I'd like to make a profit. So I make the decision as to what goes on. So all sure. of a sudden, and in and in to, in in, uh, in today's world, you would pick the the most controversial voices you could find. To, yes. to put on the page. I, I assume that's probably- You got it. You're case, going to, right? you're going to, yep, yep, yep. You got it. And that's what they've done yep. here. On every page, there are four different arguments. And so you're in, a, and what you're hearing is when you read scripture in this context in 1501, you're surrounded by a choir of voices. You have sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. They each have their part and they're each offering their interpretation of this text. And it's rich, it's rich, but it's also very complicated. It's very complicated and it, it's, it's burdensome. So here we have this wonderful beginning, but notice the care, notice the care. Do they, mm. root, do, they do all of these letters throughout the whole, all six volumes? No, 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 no. They did half of the first volume and they stopped figuring if you're interested, you can do it yourself. But what are they doing? <laughs> you can do it yourself. But what are they doing? Where are you going to start looking if you're going to be enticed to buy this set of this, these six volumes of the Bible? You're going to open the first volume. You're going to look at the title page. They've offered you, they've explained everything that's in there, who you're going to meet. And then they, they, they rubricate, they put in these, they decorate, they rubricate the first half of this volume to sort of get your attention because they know that's where the pages you're going to flip. Those are the pages you're going to turn to make your decision. All right, so here we have this. So here, here's one of the here's one of the gloss of glossa ordinaria. This is one of the texts that inhabits this page here, that inhabits this left hand column. Here's one of the here's one of the texts, and here's you you type it out in, in current Latin. There it is. So what does it say? The formless kylum. That's heavens. So what is what is what are the what is the heavens? What are we talking about? We would just say, well, it's the sky. It's you know. They said the formless matter of the spiritual life can exist, but not turned to the creator as it is in itself, in which it is formed, land of the body without any quality, which manifests itself in the matter of the formed. Boy, does that help you? No. <laughs> Confuse, nothing like confusing the issue with facts. <laughs> there you go. But, but here, but see, this is what a reader would be looking to read because they have been raised in these traditions. And so they're trying to say, what is Kylum? Well, Kylum is the, is that, you know, formless matter, you know, it's the heavens, you know, and it can exist. Um, it can exist and it may be turned to face the creator. It may not face the creator. It's in itself, it's, it's in itself. It's a separate, it's a separate entity. All right. Pastor Carl, I have yeah. a question. Sure. Um, on the on the little box where you showed us the scripture in the big letters. Yep. What's it's, in between them? 
those are that's a, a, that is the first the first set of commentary. These are what you how um, these are. Um, this is like looking at a dictionary um, or a, a lexicon. Um, they are giving you possible translations of the Latin word. So it's, okay. a, it's you're, you're looking at the words. They're, no, they're no, parsing no, the words between, between these, the, these lines. They're, they're giving you a lexicon. And here's what this possibly might mean as according to a lexicon. Then in the, on the sidelines, you then come up with the commentary. You've got the commentary. So you get a, a, an exegesis, an exegesis of the words, a, a, an explanation of the words. Then you have the commentary where the the, the thinkers weigh in. So it, this is this is interesting. I mean, this is a, a huge <laughs> amount of work. This is a huge amount of work, but they were hoping they felt that this would sell. So here we have this. You know, there's only two verses of Genesis on this whole page, which is 16 inches high. But I have a great deal of commentary. So I'm going to read this. And when you read this, you were always surrounded by the commentators. So, you know. Pastor Kruger, it's TJ. Hi there. Hi. Uh, did I hear you say there was more than one commentator? There are four. There are four. four. How do you differentiate between the commentators? You have to. Okay. Um, on this, the, if you come on this side, you see, um, go away little screen. Um, you see here, um, there we go. Uh, let's see. You see at the top left-hand corner, GLO period, O-R-D-I. Yes. You, this, is the, this is the traditional, this is the traditional commentary, the glossa ordinaria, the, the traditional tongue of interpreting, interpreting the Bible. It rolls all the way down to this, down this side. You come over here and then you have Nicholas of Lyra. And his commentary is running here. And then, oh, you, okay. then you have this. It's telling you, here is his moral interpretation. You turn the page and you will meet Paul of Ber uh, Bergos. And then you will meet Matthias, uh, Matthias, Matthias Düring. So you, you, you read on the sidelines. You read on the I sidelines. See. See. Okay. okay. Where notice, is Augustine? Notice there are no verse numbers. Yeah. yeah where, 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 is, where, is, uh, where is Augustine? Where's Augustine? Yes. Oh, well, let's see. Augustine, you, you have to worry, work yourself through here. Here's the Venerable Bede. Let me see if I can find Augustine really quickly. He will just say Augustine. Oh, this is Jerome, Hero, and it's abbreviated. That's Jerome. There's Bede. There's Bede. All right. That's uh, Alcuin. So somewhere down here, you'll probably mm. bump into AUG, and that would be Augustine. Mm. Um, so they, okay. So they just so go all this, Pardon? So for this this sixteen inch book, um, how big are we talking, and how many books have we actually gotten Eight. through? Like you need six of these volumes. They are about all. Oh, they are they weigh thirty pounds. So you've got um, the width is the probably three four five inches. They're five inches thick, so they're very hefty. You need uh -huh. six. You need six of these volumes to complete the entire Bible. Wow. Okay. So, Pastor so, Carl. Yes. Was, yes. Was was this was this rendition, if I can call it that, considered uh, a a a Bible for scholars, for theologians, a teaching Bible? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And many of these volumes, and one of ours, this volume actually actually was chained, chained to a lectern, and this would be chained. It was yep. chained to a lectern in the refectory, in the dining room, because you didn't speak when you were in a man monastic community. When you were dining, they would then read this to you, and this first volume has a hole in the back cover where they chained it to the lectern. Okay, so you would, when you were eating, they would read this to you every day. Okay, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is what they would be reading this text to. So, is this a book for the common person? Not no. really. No, not really. Obviously not. No. no. <laughs> is it for? Is it for? It is intended for teachers. It is intended yes. for people who are. How should it? Um, people who are versed in Latin, and most anybody who went to school knew Latin. So it was people of who had money. 
mm -hmm. who buy this, who were serious about their studies. This would be in a cathedral library, a monastery's library, and in the university's library. Mm. Okay, so this was not aff affordable by the general working person. This was not in their means in any way, shape, or form. Mm. <laughs> so let's look. Here's another. Here's here's a great page. Where is my scriptural text? Right in here. Mm. And what you what you oh. what I want you to see. Yeah, each page changes. It's always in the center, but the number of verses that are included will change. You know, it's no set format. It depends on how much they have, how much commentary they have. Okay. Oh, wow. So what I want you to see here is that um, white space, this white space yeah. plays a very important role. And there the printer has made a decision. I'm going to use this white space so that it sets off the text. In other words, what the printers are beginning to master following the manuscript tradition is my, I am going to optically organize my material so the reader doesn't get lost. So I am going to have these wonderful wide margins here with this white space. Why do I want that? Well, the person's going to hold it right there with their fingers. If they haven't washed their hands, which they probably haven't, um, the oil and dirt on their fingers will be transferred. I don't want them scratching or soiling the print itself. So I create these wonderful margins so that it will protect the text. Um, it, what I see it is surprising, here, though, that, that you would prioritize white space over text when you're talking about monetary value. Well, you're you're going. It's not it, you're you're prioritizing it, but you're also you're also working with your your printed text. In other words, the two are going yeah. together. You're going to make them work. You're going to create a symphony here, yeah. Um, uh, so that your reader has you don't want the reader's fingers on the text because they'll dirty it. It'll soil it. Mm -hmm. We want to protect that. Um, we've also left this beautiful white space. Um, obviously, if a, this is this is high linen, this paper is linen linen content. Um, this is this has been bleached, but bleach and linen work fine. Um, when you do wood pulp paper and you bleach it, it doesn't work very well. It oh. the bleach continues to work against the wood pulp. So if you have newspaper from 1969, the landing on the moon in your attic, I can tell you the color and I can tell you you're probably not going to be able to open it because it has <laughs> point become brittle and it's yeah. going to crumble in your hands. That's the work of the bleached in order to, to get it to, to, to become white. But in this paper, most of this paper, this is a high linen content. There was no such thing as a, a linen rag that didn't have a purpose. They'd be collected, they would be sold to the paper mill and they would be reduced to a slurry and you would create a page. You would create this page. Um, this is still pristine. It is strong, it is sturdy. It'll be here for another 500 years. So. They've printed this out and they've used this white space to sort of mark things off. And you see how they framed the biblical text using the white space. And it's like, there's this little garden path that you walk up and you can walk around and you can walk around this garden. You can walk around this garden and you can come over here to the borders, to the borders. And here's Nicholas of Lyra and all of his commentary. Um, and so you have this rich, very rich experience facing you. Here's Nicholas of Lyra and what he had to say. These are from his books and they're just, there's no such thing as a footnote yet. So they're just excerpting, you know, they're creating an excerpt, it's a, an adaptation. And you had, to, you may recognize where it came from, you may not, but they figured if you didn't know where it was, you, you hadn't paid attention in school. So they were very, <laughs> they were very, 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 very demanding. So what have I got here? All right, here's Nicholas of Lyra. Non es sapienza. It is not wise to go against the to go against the commands of God. Okay, and here here's Gregory the Great, Gregory the Great, who gave us Gregorian chant, who was one of those popes that was an administrator and intellectual, um, helped the church. You know, here's Gregory the Great in Mora in his commentary called the moral the mor the morals of Job, uh, the moralia of Job, and he then said, well, here's what here's Gre what Gregory the Great said. So you have this wonderful, all this learning that's going on there on this page. And here's a page where we've tried to, where they've then created the list of abbreviations that you would be expected to understand. 
Okay, so uh, you come down here. Here's Jerusalem. You know, here's Jerusalem. You know, I H E R L L U M. It's you know, there's Jerusalem. That's how you will see it. Um, Misericordia, mercy. Here it is. It's abbreviated. So you're al it allows you to put a, a significant number of words on a confined space with and and you use these abbreviations. And in 1501, 1502, the printers said, well, <clears throat> we need to do that. We need to do, we need to, we need to do this. Okay. So, you know, we're going to walk away from this. All right. So here are all of these wonderful abbreviations that you sort of learned mm. over time. Okay. Okay. And you learned to read. This Bible featured these. This was something they were now getting excited about. Woodcuts and illustrations, and Nicholas of Lyra gave them these diagrams, and they love to include these diagrams, and Luther will use them. Luther will use these diagrams from Nicholas of Lyra in his editions of the Bible. You know, here's the vestments of the high priest. They were described in the book of Exodus, and they just love, oh, let's take this and create an illustration. So all of a sudden, it's like, oh, a picture. Image and text work together in a ra rather neat way. Oh, here it is. Here's the here's the candelabra in the temple. Right. The candelabra in the temple. You know, this is what Rabbi Moses Moses says. Okay, but then the other people say no. The the other doctors, the other doctors say according to the other doctors, it was arranged this way. And you know, it, it's this wonderful discussion of when I read the text, I want to give you I want to give you these diagrams. And printing allowed, they had always had these in manuscript traditions, but printing allowed you to create these elaborate woodcuts. And once you did the work, <clears throat> once you had the work, you know, the work was done, you could keep using these. I mean, this was a work of art. And so all of a sudden you've attracted the attention of a potential buyer. There it is. Here's what, you know, this is according to Secundum, you know, Rabbi Moses. Here's what the, the candelabra would have looked like with, with all of the, these designs. Ah. But now other doctors say, no, it was a different style. So there's, there's discussion. There's discussion going on. Here's the, the Ark of the Covenant with the angels in which the Ten Commandments would, were carried. You know, this is, this, is, this is important. And so they love to create these diagrams and these illustrations. Where's my biblical text? Right in the middle, right in the middle. And then I have all of my commentary. Here's the regular commentary. And then Nicholas of Lyra here. All right, there you go. So there it is. This is, this is the, according to the Catholic theologians, this is what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. All right. So here you have this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation of a Bible intended for scholars. Okay. Now we're finished with this. And I want to take you through one more Bible, which I find very exciting, a lot of fun. And I think you will, you will as well. So let's shut this down and let's come back to share screen. Ta-da! And then we will wrap it up with this. So we are now in, we have moved down 23 years later. We're down 23 years later, okay? So this is a Bible published in Latin in 1524. This is folded twice, so it's a quarto. You can hold this in your hand very easily. <coughs> Notice the difference between the title page of what you saw in 1501 and what you see now. A replica. Yeah, and we've got we've got a lot of we've got a lot of, you know, we we use red and black. You know, we we put it right on the title page. So this is ooh, this is this is exciting, you know. Here we have all of this. We have this uh, here are my predecessors, Library of the Theological Seminary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church Philadelphia. They boom, stamped it right on there. So, you know, it was their book. So, here we have this wonderful edition. You could hold this in your hand. And this was meant for a more, this was, you're going to see some wonderful things here. Once again, we're going to give you all of this information on the title page so you know what you're buying. So, all right. So let me just, let me just reduce it. Let me reduce it. The Bible with improved and now more resources, never seen before. Now there's a paratext. That's an important moment. Never seen before. So you've, 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 You've caught the interest of a potential buyer, you know, canonical agreement, new understandings and old arguments. That is a cool way to get your attention. You know, you might want to buy this edition of the Bible. You know, new, re new more resources never seen before. This Bible is ingenious. This Bible is ingenious um, is how it was organized. 
this Bible was intended for you to exercise your memory. And so what they did is they continually gave you little poems that you would be expected to memorize so that you could absorb the various content of the book. This is what we did in confirmation in, in <laughs> some way, um, in some way, in some way, uh, you know, when you had to learn the books of the Bible for confirmation, you know, they, they would, mm -hmm. this is, this is, think of it that way. Okay. Yeah. This is how we're dividing the books up. We've got the history, we've got the Pentateuch, we've got the history books, we've got the poetry, then we have the prophets, we have the major prophets, the minor prophets, boom, 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 boom. So they're all listed here very, very, very nicely. And it was intended, this was intended to become an exercise that you could memorize. So you could get through this and you could train yourself to remember what the very the names of the books. So here it is, here's, here's the first five books. And you know their names, you can see them right there in very clear, very clear, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There they are. I'm not seeing the same thing. Yeah, is, is everybody seeing this? Because I... You don't? No, I'm not seeing I, it. I don't think I'm seeing it either. No. I'm seeing that Replica, see. Genesis, Law 3, 4, Replica. Let me see. Where am I? Let me see here. Hold on. Stop share. All right. Let's see what we've got here. Thanks for saying that. All right. How's that? 1524 Paris. Yes. Latin there we go. Yes. Yep. There you go. Okay. All right. There All right. Sorry. Sorry. Okie doke. Here we go. Now we're with you. All right. So here we have on the title page, new and improved, now more resources, never seen before. So a printer's got your attention. You've never seen this before. Canonical agreement, new understandings, old arguments. Cool. All right. So now I have this wonderful page where all of the books of the Old Testament are arranged according to their categories. And I can create, I have this wonderful way of divvying them up. I can see them. I can see them. It's really exciting. Boy, this is like, you know, this would have made confirmation fun. We probably had little books like that as well when we were in confirmation, how you learned this. So here's the, the Pentateuch. We know the books in the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So here are the books, here are the books of the law, and here we have them. And we have, there are five in number. There are, there are five in number, and here are their names. So you would memorize that. You could memorize that. Here are the books of history, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Kings, and then Chronicles, and then Esdras, which is a part of the Apocrypha. Tobit is part of the Apocrypha. Judith, Judith is part of the Apocrypha, but they were still mixed together. They were mixed mm -hmm. together. Then you have Job and Maccabees. So we, we, we're going to have that discussion when we get to Luther and the Reformation. What do we do with, we don't see those books. They, are, they were removed and put in another part of the Bible. They made a decision. They made a decision. So here you have the books of poetry. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, you know, wisdom, Ecclesiastes. There you go. So now you have a representation of all the books that you're going to find in the Old Testament outline for you. Boom. And somebody's actually worked on this. Somebody <laughs> was working with this book and left a few notes. Here we have it. All right. So here we have, and what he's writing is, this is the Syriac. This is the Syrian, this is a Syriac title. So what are they talking about? Oh, they have something else in, in their mind and they want to put it down there. Okay. Here are all the books of the Bible. All right. Now, if you wanted to find your place in the books of the Bible, um, here we have you need to, we have page numbers so you don't, don't get lost we don't want you to get lost if you would like to learn about if you would like to learn about amos please turn to 365 if you want to look at the book of the apocalypse head, head to 494 and other books of revelation if you want to look at the beginning of the book of baruch you want to go to 329 so they're giving you a table of contents and it's numbered by page number which is something new this is something new and adventurous and the edit, the printers are making these decisions we know now, and we can. We now know where we've printed these pages. We know where they are. Let's give them. Let's give them. Let's give them the number so they can find their way quickly. These are the new. These are the new resources that have never been seen before. Oh, look at all that! <clears throat> I know where I am. I can find my way through this. Now, okay. <clears throat> now comes the fun part. These are these are these are little poems for e these are little sentences for each chapter in a book. So this is the book of, of Genesis, 
and you're going to you are going to have a little sentence a little sentence about each chapter that you could memorize so you could actually then recite all 50 chapters the content of all 50 chapters if you learned this little poem in latin okay so it gave you a way of exercising your memory memory is important in this edition the printer wants you to work with your memory so that you can improve your memory and recall what you've been reading. So here we have these little poems, these little statements, you know, Genesis, <clears throat> creation of the world in six days, chapter one, you know, and then here's the, here's the, here's the command of what you may, what you may not eat, the prohibition, Adam and Eve sin, you know, so this is chapter three, you know, Adam and Eve sin, you know, and, and so you have all of these little, little statements that you would do. Notice the variation in type size. Yeah. So you could always remember what you could remember what was going on in the book of Genesis. There is a, this is done for each book of the Bible. Um, they will do this. So they're really giving you these keys that will help you remember the content of the Bible. And then here's an alphabetical listing of the various topics that you might be want to look up. Well, here's where you will find it. You want to talk about angels? Here's, you want to talk about the altars, the altars in the temple? Here's the pages for the altars. They are giving you, they are giving you in a very handy volume that you can hold in your hand. All of this information about, about where you can find things if you wish to, if you're interested in pursuing it. It's a mini concordance, so to say. Yeah. So it's, it's a, and this is 1524. So this has evolved from huge folio volumes in 1501 to a printer in Paris saying, I'm going to print this in Latin, but I'm going to give you all of these new devices that will help you engage the text. I want you, to, the reader, to engage the text. And look at what we've done here. Well, we've got these little woodcuts, these, these little woodcuts that are follow, you know, we, where we introduce the chapter with a rather, this is um, Jerome's, this is Jerome's, um, Jerome's uh, prologue to, 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 the, um, to the Latin Bible. This was written by Jerome in the fourth century, and this is his prologue. Then you have here chapter, here you have the various chapters. So then you're going to get you then see, oh, here's chapter two, here's chapter three. I don't know where they put chapter one, but I'll find it eventually. Oh, that chapter <laughs> one, it's up here. There it is, right. So in Chippet, here we get the direction, we get Jerome, and then we come on and we start with our chapters. So we're, we're getting, we're getting these, we have this, these nice little woodcut illuminated initials that duplicated that in a very informative way. All right, there you go. Look at that, all that nicely mapped out on this page printed. And when you get to here, the six date, here's something to keep you interested. Here's some illustrations that made it look interesting. Here's the first day, the second day, the third, the fourth, the six days of creation are mapped out here and you can see somebody's decided, well, maybe I should color one of these in. And mm -hmm. they, they just started, they never finished it. You know, we don't know what happened. So here's God creating, here's God creating and here on the second day, the, the seas. The third day, the fourth day is the sun, the moon, the dividing land from sea on the third day. Sixth day, creation of Adam and Eve. So you have all this, you, 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 you've had this, oh, look at this. Here's the six days, it, it's like, a TV, yeah. like being on Facebook, you know, all images, there it is. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way of presenting the Bible. So, and here we now get to Genesis, you know, in principio creavit. This is easier to read because it's, it, you have the full text in front of you. You can keep reading. And on the side, you have some of the commentary, some of the commentary that goes with that, okay? So that's, that's pr produced on the sides, but you have a complete running text. Publisher, the printer thought they need this. This will make it much easier. It'll be more interesting if we just have this running text. Let's cut back on some of the commentary. So here we have, you know, here's the beginning. Here's the beginning of the book of Genesis, which in Hebrew is called Bereshit, in Chippi, the beginning. And then they give you a very quick chapter summary right here. And off we go into the book of Genesis and this wonderful woodcut. This wonderful woodcut of God, the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals, and a unicorn. Everybody needs a unicorn. Everybody needs a unicorn in their Bible. So here you have the title page, this wonderful edition, the red, black ink catches your attention. You have this, these, these tables, these little poems that are there. And the very last page, 
the very last page of this edition of the Bible has this. This is, this speaks volumes of what this, this person was intending to do. Remember, I kept saying to you, remember, I kept saying memory, memory. That was what this book was all about. All right. Who's here? This is Jerome. According to tradition, tradition, Jerome was elevated to cardinal for his work on the translation of the Bible and, clean, and working with some of the Latin texts, trying to fix it. Here we have it. And so that's his name there. So if you didn't know who that was, <coughs> there's his name. He was a, a tradition. He's a cardinal. So he's hung his cardinal's hat up. The day of administration is over. We're all done there. Okay. Now, according to tradition, um, he took a thorn out of a lion's paw. And the lion was so grateful that the lion then followed Jerome all around. So in every iconic picture of Jerome, you will always see a lion. It's actually a mistake. They confused the wrong saint. But hey, <laughs> it's stuck. <clears throat> you can't, you know, sometimes it's a mistake. So here we have the lion. So he is the doorstop, so to say. He is what you would, if you were a professor and you had an office, what did you want to do? Don't do, this was the do not disturb sign. I'm busy translating, do not disturb me. My lion who is, has one eye closed has another eye open as watching you. Now, <coughs> here is Jerome, fourth century, and he is using something that was developed a little later. This is a book wheel. This is where you put your folio volumes. This costs a lot of money. And Jerome laid out the money. So he, you, tech, you know, it, be, it costs money to be a professor. So you have this wonderful book wheel where you then can turn the books and these big folio volumes and consult them. And there he is with quill <clears throat> and paper there, the crucifix. <clears throat> All this, he's got his folios here. He has his quartos on the table. He's set to go for a night of study, night of translation. Memory, memory, where is that? Right over here in the upper left-hand corner. Memory, it's a caged bird. If you want your memory to work, you have to feed it. You have to give it water. You have to take care of it. If you don't, it'll fly away and you'll lose your thoughts. Mm. So when I say memory is very important in this edition of the Bible, and this was, this was dramatically created on the last page with this wonderful woodcut of Jerome with a caged bird right by the window, which says, if you don't take care of your memory, you don't feed it, you don't water it, you don't work with it, it, will, it may fly away and you'll lose your train of thought. And we can all identify with that, yes? Yes, indeed. <laughs> 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 so that, that's, you saw, and what my, my whole point was for you to just see tonight what a Bible looked like in 1501, 1502, and then what it was starting to look like in 1524. Mm. And the point is, that when you release edition, an edition of the Bible, from now on, you're going to have to introduce something new. You're going to have to, in, you're going to, have to entice a buyer with something that you, only your edition has. Does that make sense? I mean, if you're trying to sell a Bible, if you're trying to sell a, a Bible, um, if you're trying to sell a Bible, you have to offer something new to, to, to intrigue your buyer. So you're going to create these little these little moments, these little poems, you're going to create, you're going to offer something new and you've got to get it on the first page, right in the first page of your edition of the Bible. This is what is new about my copy of the Bible. Maybe you'd like to buy it because it's going to be on a table at a book fair. And so the printers are making decisions about how the Bible is going to be shared, how the Bible is going to be shared. And they realize it's, it's challenging. But it's an exciting adventure, and you saw how it changed in just 23 years. Yeah. So questions, or have I left you all confused? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, I wonder when uh, the responsibility for uh, layout and design moved from the printer's jurisdiction to that of, let's say, a graphic design group somewhere uh -huh. how many centuries did it take for mm -hmm. the printer to lose that position of power you're going to be um 
Yeah, that, that's an interesting that's interest, an interesting thing. When you're, you, you know, the printers will hold on to it. Um, they're going to use woodcuts, but then comes photographs. And so mm -hmm. when do you see photographs starting to appear ap appear in, in newspapers? You know, um, so I'm reading the Lutheran the Lutheran <clears throat> the a Lutheran newspaper uh, that started in 1859. I'm, my goal is to read it up to about 1911. Um, so there it is, you know, and I'm in 1873 and I have yet to see a woodcut or a photograph. Hmm. <laughs> so it comes, it comes later and it's uh, the technology. It's how can I reproduce, how can I reproduce this? And how, when does steam take over? When is the printing press then run by a steam engine as opposed to a manual printing press where you have a printer pulling, you know, it, all of this is technology generated. Yeah. And when you, and when you start, when you have photographs, you have a new group of people that you have to start talking to, you know? And you're, 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 you're all of a sudden, you know, uh, I have a photograph. Okay, where do we put the photograph? <laughs> what exactly. do we do with this? <laughs> exactly. And up until now, it was the printer who made that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then also and the telegraph. I mean, it took 10 days in the, in, the Lutheran, in the Lutheran newspaper that I'm reading. Reports from Europe took 10 days. They were, to, you know, because they had to come by ship and it took at least 10 days, weather permitting, mm -hmm. <laughs> weather permitting. So mm. um, we're in the, uh, I wrote an article about the 1866 war uh, between Prussia and Austria. And they're, they're, they're publishing, they're printing, printing, they're printing papers and they have, they're 10 days behind and the transatlantic cable goes live and it works. The mm. first one failed. And they finally got this thing to work in, they, in 1859, it failed. They got it to oh. work. <clears throat> and the, the, all of a sudden news arrives on the same day that one, the war is ended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the war ended after a five day ceasefire Austria has surrendered. The emperor is packing his bags to go into exile or to flee. And Prussia is now on top. And it's like this moment, and it's the first piece of news that is published is, you know, they were sitting there the day before it was like, well, everything's in disorder. Um, the, 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 the Prussians are moving quickly. We think we, and then the next day, boom. And it's, it's, it's over. all over and it's been over for five <laughs> days already. So, I mean, so, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's an exciting, it's a world of technology and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then you have to, you know, the, the telegraph, the tel transatlantic cable went from Ireland to Newfoundland. So then you have to then, how do we get word from Newfoundland down to us? How will we, how, who pays for it? You know, who pays for this? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's an exciting, and it's an exciting, it's an exciting mm -hmm. venue to, to look at, you know, and, and uh, so, and Printing the Bible is the same way, you know. What do I? What can I offer that's new? You know, when uh, the Bible went from Latin to German, yes, uh, by Martin Luther. No. Now, did the He's editors the did the editors then still have commentary? Did the oh, we'll get still there. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do in April. I'm going to pull out the German Bibles and show you. Ah. <laughs> And remember, Luther's father was into copper mining and copper smelting. So Luther learned how to that he needed to micromanage certain things. And Luther is going to micromanage things and put in his two cents. And we know what, what he where we can see his fingerprints on what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, right. He is not the first to translate it into German. He's number 19. OK. okay. Um, uh, what he is first if you qualify the statement. See, if you qualify it, then you can finally come to some, you know, you can say he's the first. He is the first person to translate the Bible from the Greek into German. Right. 18 prior to him were translating the Bible into German from Latin. Okay. And it but was do we still have commentary. Oh, well, I don't want to, 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 you know, I want to keep a little mystery here. So you're well, okay. April because, you know, okay. you, I, I won't rush it. You're going to have commentary. Do you think Luther isn't going to give you 
a little commentary? <laughs> well, I think Mr. Langston will have a lot to say. <laughs> yes, you got it. Luther had a lot to say. Luther had a lot to say, and he wanted you to understand it correctly. So, he, particularly after the Peasants' Revolt in 1525, he had a, he realized that you know we have to be careful. Um, he was upset about the peasants using the Bible to support their cause. So mm -hmm. is Luther concerned about giving you some of his opinions? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it goes down to what images he will reproduce and what images he wanted pulled out. Yeah, he has some things to say and you'll see his fingerprints and it's fun. It's fun. It's a lot of fun to see all of this, you know? And my joy was, I have them in the rare book room. When COVID passes, you can come to this, we can do a field trip to the cemetery, cemetery, <laughs> seminary, and I will bring them all out and you can come and, and smell them. They all have a different odor. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and Wonderful. They, they, this will do a field trip in the fall <laughs> to the seminary all and right. bring them all out and you can see them. They're the real thing. They, you know. love to see it. Pastor Kruger. Yes. Hi, um, TJ. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Um, I noticed that uh, we did talk about the red and blue color. Yes. And it reminded me that in particular, the King James Version of the Bible, one uses red color, excuse me, red color was used to indicate that these were the words of, of, of God, Jesus Christ. And... I noticed that at least on that first page, and I know we were in the quote unquote Old Testament, uh, but where did that red color come about to indicate that these were words of God? You mean words of Jesus? Words of Jesus, yes, excuse me. That comes, that comes in, the, it, it, I, red letter. it's a 19th century, it's a 19th century, uh, Actually, probably early 20th century creation. Um, the 20th letter. century. Hmm? Uh, okay. No, I was just. It's a red letter edition, and um, you know, um, I actually had one. I think, yeah, I think there's one in the house. Um, there's two of them in here. You know, the red letter edition, and that was a, a, a modern. It was an, an idea to separate, optically organize the material, so that when you saw this, you said, "Oh, Jesus said this." You know, so yeah, it comes about in, in the 20th century. <laughs> What they're doing there, uh, they're just using red to get your attention. Um, yes, I understood that. They, they're yeah. getting your attention and they're telling you what they will normally do in the manuscript tradition is in Chippit Liber Genesis. Here begins the book of Genesis and that will be in red. Mm -hmm. And then the text will be in black, will be printed with black type in with a black ink. Okay. So they're getting your attention to say, these are our words. These weren't, in, they're, they're, these are the words we're adding in Chippy Liber Genesis. This is the beginning of the book of Genesis. Here is the biblical text. So you don't understand, don't think that in Chippy, the beginning of the book of Genesis was a biblical text. That's our thing. We put that in red to differentiate between our, our statement, our, our statement, and then the Bible. Do you, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And okay. so you, you will do that. Um, and... <clears throat> We, 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 we get from this, uh, it, in Latin, it's the rubric, it's, um, the word is uh, the rubricator, um, rubrics. We get the word rubrics. You've heard yes. us say rubrics. Yeah. Rubrics, it simply means red. And what it meant is in our hymnal, in ELW, they do this, the rubrics are printed in red. So these are, these are, this is not the text, this is, these are the guidelines. These are, these are the, the, the guidelines. Uh, these are the, the helps, the aids that will get you through this. So here are the rubrics. You know, hmm. congregation should stand, congregation should sit, um, read here, read that. So the, the rubrics were done in red and it comes out of the manuscript tradition. Uh, red ink was easy, was easy, easy to produce. Um, red ink was easy, very easy to produce and, and black ink was easy to produce and everybody had that green, yellow, other colors were a little more complicated, more expensive. Um, so you didn't necessarily have, have that available to you. We will see a 1483 Bible that was printed in um, Nuremberg. Well, Kohlberger designs it. I want to say it's Cologne. 
he paid for it, but it's 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 uh, one of the volumes is that the uh, the woodcuts are colored in, and this person obviously had some money because you've got red, green, and yellow. Yeah. And so somebody had a lot of had some money that they wanted to show off their mm -hmm. money. Pastor Carl, this is Susan. Hi there. I have I have a transitional question uh, prompt for food for thought for tomorrow's Bible study. All right. Which is if we looked at the Bible he showed us tonight mm -hmm. and we went to Galatians, <laughs> right? What would the commentators say about ah. some of the things we have been discussing? Okay. I, th I think that would be interesting, particularly, particularly because, well, no, just I think that would be an interesting segue for tomorrow. All right. Do you wait. have three hours, Susan? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure Pastor Carl can cover this in minutes. Oh yeah. You know, we oh, may talk oh, about oh, it for hours, but he can cover it in a actually, minute. Actually, the 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 book. Um, it's interesting. The, this gloss, the gloss. Um, the book that had the the most extensive gloss was the Song of Solomon. Um, and the Song of Solomon was very important in in the Middle Ages um, because it was seen as an allegory. An allegory mm. between Christ and the church, Christ loving the yeah. church, and that. Yeah. So it had this rich, this rich allegorical um, narrative that was attached to it. Commentary mm. narrative, this allegorical commentary. The book that had the least amount of <laughs> gloss was Second Chronicles. <laughs> it's like, well, what can we say about this? David died. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that. Um, so it, the. The only, the, the only, there are only two books, and this is interesting of where we are at in research. There are only two books that have, where the gloss has been translated from Latin into English. The one is the Song of, Sol uh, the, the Song of Solomon. So that was the heaviest one. They wanted that out. And the other is Romans. They translated the gloss from Romans into English. So you could find, so you could read through that because, and it was, it, because Romans is one of the books that Luther will hold on to, basically, as he moves forward in the Reformation thinking. So they said, well, let's see what Luther saw, read in the book of Romans. Um, I've never read Galatians a, a gloss, but I'll try and I'll try and skim skim through some things to see what they're saying. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a you you. It's it's interesting to see printers <clears throat> making these decisions and then. Yeah. Trying to, how, how how can we get you to buy a copy of this Bible? You know, so to, the, to that to when that point, did the how imprimatur come into effect? I'm sorry. When did the imprimatur come into effect? Oh, that was always there. That was always there. It meant it, meant it had approval. It Even had, the printers had to follow that. Yes, they would always. They were very careful. Well, they didn't necessarily follow it, but they were always aware of it. They will get into trouble mm -hmm. as we go down the road. Um, okay. They will get into trouble as we get into the era of the Reformation. You know, they, they all of a sudden it's like, who gave you the authority to do? For example, right. in 1408, 1409 at the Synod of Oxford, the church, the church, English Catholic Church decreed that there would be no translations of the Bible into English without the permission of a bishop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when Tyndale in the 1520s wants to translate the Bible into English, he has to leave England and go to continental Europe. Hello. Hi. So, okay, uh, Paul, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, uh, I was, I simply wanted to ask, um, when we we're talking about all of this common commentary, how would the printers have chosen who would have been the personalities to provide the commentary? Ah, they were already in manuscript. There was a manuscript with those on there. So you, you had the manuscript tradition, a living, a lively, very active manuscript tradition of the Glossa Ordinaria. Um, it was started in the 12th century and it continued to grow. They had manuscripts in front of them. And what you saw printed in 1501, 1502 was what a manuscript tradition would have, what the manuscript tradition looked like. So they had a manuscript of the gloss, the traditional gloss. They had this, a manuscript uh -huh. tradition. They had manuscripts of Lyra's, Lyra's commentary and so they just they just started at it. They created this format. Um, it worked if you kept it. 
But as you notice, it disappears. By 1524, they're, they're moving on because if you wanted to make a change, the whole thing fell apart because huh? the was so yeah. compact with okay. information. If you made a change, if you made a change, the whole thing would, would fall apart. You know, it, it just, it just, so they decided sometimes less, maybe, maybe better. And <laughs> who, and who is, and who is at the, sort of at the helm of the printer? Uh, uh, well, be, beyond the printer, I mean, if they had this, this body of work to pull from, mm -hmm. there, there was a, some other authority that was maintaining I the body of work, right? No? I think what you're trying to say, Paul, is, uh, the, all of these commentators, uh, the printer chose them. Why? Right. Uh, why did he choose them? Is that what I'm? I'm hearing. Not, not so much. I, I mean, I... the ultimate authority was the buyer. If the edition <laughs> sold out, they knew they had a bestseller. Okay. If they were ah. stuck with, if they couldn't sell out. They knew this was not going anywhere, and after a while, they had they had saturated. They started printing the, the gloss with the the his, the, the um the um the gloss with the Bible. They started in the 1480s, and by 1501, 1502, this is one of the final editions that includes all of this because the the market was saturated, and so when they have resid when they can't sell a their books when they can't sell them, they know. It's finished, and we've got to find something else to do. Okay. So the gotcha. buyer, the buyer, the, this is capitalism. Yep. The buyer yep. is is going to. Mm -hmm. the, the uh, that, yeah, that's where I thought we were headed. I, yep. I was just trying to. Yep. You know. You're, the buyer is ultimately the buyer is the ultimate decider, and by doing this, the, you know they were giving you a book, and it's like you can take this home and read it and make up your own mind. You know. Think about it, but the buyer when the, when they had when they couldn't sell uh, when they couldn't sell their books, um, they knew that they had they had um, it was over. Yeah. Could a buyer request certain commentary? Pardon? Could a buyer request certain commentary for a printer to create for him? In the manuscript era, yes. In the printed era, in the era of printing it becomes more complicated because they could no longer, they could no longer, they could not afford to, to um, fulfill, <clears throat> they could no longer, they could no longer afford to customize to, to the, mm, that's an interesting question and I'm, I'm tripping over my words here. Do you mean such a limited edition was too expensive to yes. produce? Yeah. yeah. They couldn't yeah. cater. Uh, they couldn't cater to that. Um, yeah. So if I wanted just one, this commentary, um, they would, they wouldn't, they, they couldn't deal with that because of the lab, the labor intense, the, the labor, the intensive labor, the labor that was involved in setting the type, printing it, then cleaning it, putting the type back in the cases, doing it over and over again. They couldn't, they couldn't deal, they couldn't um, cater to the whims of, the only place they could cater to the whims is the binding. Okay. Mm -hmm. the was, binding. Was, the Catholic, hmm? was the Catholic Church the largest buyer? I mean, you know, when I think back to who had money in that era, it was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was was the buyer, particularly for its cathedrals, its monasteries, and the universities. But what is emer what emerged during the manuscript tradition, particularly, or was the merchant class, um, the merchant class who were literate, um, looked for the classics. Um, they were they were the up and coming. They were the up and coming market. The printers knew were interested in buying their product. Yeah, I I assume the Catholic Church is not. I, I mean, maybe this is a bad assumption, but I would assume the Catholic Church is not terribly interested in the commentary. Wouldn't they have their own? You know, oh, these are all, all the commentaries that you see are the Catholic or Roman yeah, Catholic. They're all Catholic Church. They're, well, I know, but wouldn't they already know that? Do they need it written down for them? 
Oh, um, oh yes. Well, you're training, you're training priests, you're training students, you're training monks. So they always needed new copies of, of these these commentaries, and and they repeated it. They would repeat these commentaries time and time again because they wanted you to understand this is this is this is what we we hold. This is what so and so said. This is what so and so said. This is what you were expected to know those things. Right. So if you only have a handful of commentaries that can fit on the page, then somebody has to pick the ones right. that are going to be there, right? Right. And but they knew that the Glossa Ordinaria, Nicholas of Lyra, and then his detractors would attract attention, and people were interested in reading their arguments. And um, so they knew that this was this was this was important. And but as I said, eventually they they realized the market is saturated. We have saturated the market with this. Um, it's uh, we need to move on. And then along comes the Reformation. And Luther, Luther's going to, you know, Erasmus and Luther are going to, to become the Stephen Kings of, <laughs> of, 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 you know, continental Europe. Well, was there also simultaneously a renaissance, if you will, of libraries? Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, th this was the renaissance of libraries that the printing press permitted and so I would I would think they would have been um, along with the the merchanteers mm -hmm. the market for these books right um, oh yeah but it this the libraries were starting to return libraries were being created in the, the middle of the 15th century in the 1450s libraries mm -hmm. begin to emerge as as um, as places where people would talk um, particularly in uh, Florence Milan, um, you, 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 you sort of, you took pride in your library. Um, Pope Nicholas V will create, begin what is, will become the Vatican Library. And that's in the 1450s. And he, you know, so yes, libraries are interested. They were buying manuscripts. They, there they could cater to the whim of a particular customer. <clears throat> I'm looking for Cicero, I want this. I'm looking for Plato, I want this. And they would, they'd copy it out, here you are. Printing press, yes. Print once, once, once you get a printing press, and you then have you will pr print. The normal run for a book is three hundred copies. Okay, you couldn't you couldn't go out on a limb. You had to be very careful because if you didn't sell that, you ended up in prison, in debtor's prison, um, and a few printers did end up uh, in you know failed. Well, Gutenberg failed. I mean, we know more about Gutenberg and all of his lawsuits and his bankruptcy. Than we do about his life. <clears throat> so he has, um, so yeah, you have these, um, you have 300 copies. Now, Luther's New Testament, uh, the September New Testament, they, 1522, they print 3,000. Hmm. They sold out. And in December, they had to do another run of 3,000. So you see how, you see how printers are now working. When I say Luther becomes the Stephen King, um, along with Erasmus, I'm not joke. I'm not kidding. Uh, you know, it is. And mm -hmm. the printers realized that we knew we now have an author who is going to write in German to talk to us, and he's living as opposed to having died in 400 A.D. Uh, in the year of our Lord 425 A.D. He's living, and this is hot. This is hot. This is this is this is hot. The printing press facilitated this. You know the printing press. The printing press. If John Hus, if John Hus, John Hus had had a printing press, he we'd all be Hussites. <laughs> we'd all be Hussites. <laughs> but uh, he, you know, they, 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 he didn't. Yeah. So you see, you see. I mean, but the the idea what I'm getting across here is that you have a Bible. If you're interested in producing a new edition of the Bible, you have to be sure of your market. And you're going to have to offer something new, innovative. And this is what is going to drive us. And it, it comes, it still exists in our world today. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You go to a bookstore and go to the Bible section. Well, it's the Bible. But we have the ecologic, the eco Bible. We have the such and such the paraphrase. Bible we have, and the men's Bible. And <laughs> yeah, you got all of this stuff in here. And, it, and, and it's interesting. And it starts here. And it's fun to just watch. And it's fun to watch the page of the Bible morph. You saw what the page of the Bible looked like in 1501 and 1502. 
It was very tiresome, very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. That's by 1524, you can see they've done away, they've pushed the comment, little, they give you little commentary in the margins, but they're just giving you the text. And they're just giving you some minor, minor, minor commentary, but let's just give you the text. And that's, that's, uh, that's the decision of 1516. And we'll see that next time. And we'll see the 1516 Erasmus Bible that threw the, that threw the door open to, to um, saying farewell to a medieval format. What you saw in 1501, 1502 was a medieval format, was duplicated many times in manuscript format. Printers picked it up because they knew it would, would sell. It did. By 1516, the market was saturated, and it's like, we need something different. And Erasmus of Rotterdam came along and said, I've got an idea, and it'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there it is, the Bible. The Bible. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me to your screens. Thank you for yes, teaching. Thank you.